Hello everyone. Thank you for attending the event. My name is Wen Gao Ye. I'm a software engineer at Google. I have more than five years of experience in distributed systems and backend development. Today, my topic is how to design a distributed file system. We will have a Q&A session in the last 15 minutes. Cool. Um, today, we will have four sessions. Uh, first, I will give you a brief introduction to DFS. Then, we start from storing a file in one machine, then involve it to store an extra large file across multiple machines. Later on, we discuss how to decide two most important operations, read and write in DFS. All right, let's start our journey. Before we start, let's talk about what is a distributed system. Put simply, when we use multiple machines to solve problems that cannot be solved by a single machine, then we form a distributed system. For example, in a single machine, we don't have enough storage to store a large number of files. Then a distributed file system comes to rescue. Another example, in a single machine, we don't have enough computational capacity to tackle the workload. Then a distributed computing system comes to rescue. Some people may ask, what is a distributed computing system here? I will encourage you to think about the divide and conquer algorithm. We can split a large number into multiple smaller sub problems. For each sub problem, we can solve it in one single machine. Finally, we merge the results of each sub problem to gain the final result. That's how a typical distributed computing system does. Some famous distributed computing system include MapReduce, Apache Spark, Apache Flink, and etc. If you have great interest in the distributed computing system, I can host another event dedicated to discuss how to decide one. Now, we already have an intuitive understanding of distributed systems. Then, what is DFS? A DFS distributed file system is just a file system that is distributed on multiple file servers or multiple locations. It allows programs to read and write isolated files as they do with the local ones, allowing programmers or systems to access files from any network or computer. Some famous DFS implementations, Google File Systems, aka GFS, and Hadoop Distributed File System, aka HDFS. One thing needs your attention here is that HDFS is the open source version of GFS. All right, some people may ask, why do we need DFS? As I mentioned in previous slides, in a single machine, we may not have enough storage to store a large number of files. Furthermore, there are three other reasons. Firstly, hardware failures are quite common. A single machine can lead to the single point failure. Secondly, the number and size of files can be quite large. A single machine cannot meet this requirement. Thirdly, the number of read or write requests can be also large. A single machine is not able to serve a high volume of requests. Next, let's talk about how to store files in physical machines. 
before we deep dive into the details of a DFS, let's talk about how we store a file in one machine. Or say, how does our laptop store a file? Logically, we separate the disk into two regions, one for the file metadata, the other one for data blocks, which are the actual file data. In file metadata, we store the file information, including file name, created type, last modified type, file size, etc., and the data block index, which we call the offset to the data blocks in the disk. A quick question here. Are the files stored separately or stored consecutively? Some people may note in Windows, files are stored consecutively while they are stored separately in Linux. Generally speaking, a data block, I mean the, the block size are 1 KB, 2 KB, or 4 KB for 32 bit systems. And a data block of a data block size of 8 KB is also available on 64 bit systems. Why use blocks? There are two advantages. First one, it is easier to detect errors because we can calculate a checksum for each data block and use the checksum to detect the error. Second, it is a uh, second reading multiple blocks allow the operating system to cache the last few blocks and avoid the latency when the application eventually needs them. Okay, um, now let's involve the solution to enable us to store an extra large files across multiple machines. Similar to the single machine solution, we separate the systems into a controller server and multiple chunk servers. The controller server is used for storing the file metadata, while the chunk servers are used for storing the actual file data. As we can see, in the controller server, we store the file information, the file name, created type, modified type, file size, blah, 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 and the chunk server address where each chunk is located respectively. One thing needs your attention. Compared to the single machine solution, here we use chunk instead of block. Generally, a chunk is 64 megabytes. There are pros and cons to use chunk instead of block. The advantage is that you know, since the, a chunk is quite larger than a block, we can reduce the number of chunks, or say blocks of a file, so that it can reduce the size of a metadata for a file. Cause we store less number of chunk index. However, we may waste space for small files. For example, if the size of a file is less than 64 megabytes, let's say, just only 10 KB, we still need to use an entire chunk to store the 10 KB file data. The controller server only stores the chunk server address for each chunk. No need to store the disk offset for, for each chunk. The offset information will be taken care of by each chunk server. There are two advantages. First, it can reduce the size of a metadata in controller. Second, it can reduce the traffic between the controller and the chunk server. There's no need to notify the controller if the offset changes. All right, we already have the fundamental knowledge of how to store files in one single machine. 
and store large files across multiple machines. Now, let's deep dive into how to decide the workflow of the right operation. Basically, there are six steps to write a file in DFS. Step one, the client splits the file into multiple chunks. For example, if the size of the file is, let's say, 35, 42 megabytes, then the number of chunks is equal to 56. We just used the size of the file to divide by the size of a chunk. Then for each chunk, the client sends a request to the controller server to allocate chunk servers. In step two, the controller sends to sends back to the client with the location of the chunk server replicas and the primary replica. In step three, the chunk, uh, sorry, the client transfers the chunk data to the primary chunk replica chunk server, as well as the address of secondary replicas. In step four, the primary replica chunk server replicates the chunk data to the secondary replica chunk server A and B. In step five, once the secondary replicas complete, complete the write operation, they report APK back to the primary replica server. In step six, the primary replica server sends the confirmation back to the client. Then we go back to the step one for the last chunk. Here are some quite frequently asked questions regarding the right operation. If we want to modify it or update a file, how to do that? In GFS, it doesn't support the modified or update operations. So the solution is simple. We just delete the old file, and then write a new one, the modified one from scratch. The reason is that if the chunk becomes larger or smaller after the modification, how to handle the remaining data in subsequent chunks, this will eventually lead to a rewrite like operation. How to identify whether a chunk on the disk is broken. We can calculate the chunk, the check, sorry, we can calculate the checksum for each chunk and then use the checksum to detect the error. How to avoid chunk data loss when a chunk server is down or failed? The answer is simple, just use a replica. We store at least three replicas for each chunk data to avoid a single point failure. How to recover when a chunk is broken? We can just ask the controller for other replica chunk servers for the broken chunk. I will talk about these questions uh, deeply uh, in the last few minutes. Let's go to the last question. How to find whether a chunk server is down? The answer is also is simple. Uh, we can use heartbeat. The chunk server sends the heartbeat signal to the controller server periodically. If the chunk server lost connection for a specific type, then we can consider that it is down. Okay, let's talk a bit more regarding how to recover when a chunk is broken. The basic idea is to ask the controller server for help. As illustrated in this diagram, the chunk server file found that the data chunk three was broken. Then it asked the controller server for the address of the replica of data chunk three. In the controller server, after checking the file data metadata, it replied chunk server file with the address of data chunk three replica. 
let's say there are chunk server two and chunk server eight. Then chunk server five picks one of the replicas. For example, it picks the replica, which is the closed one or the last business one, uh, sorry, or the next PC one at the moment. And then it sends a request to the target chunk server for the replica data. Cool. As we have figured out the right operation, the workflow for read operations will be simple and straightforward. There are only four steps for the read operations. In step one, the client sends file read request to the controller. Then in step two, the controller server replies with a list of chunk servers, which contain the actual file data, I mean the file chunks data for the corresponding file. In step three, the client cache the metadata and sends a data request to one of the replicas for each file chunk. In step four, the corresponding chunk server returns the requested chunk data back to the client. As usual, some frequently asked questions for the read operations. What is the main task for the controller server? Basically two. First one, it stores the metadata of each file. The second one, it also stores the mapping of file paths and chunk index to the chunk server address. Why not send data to the controller and let it take care of the actual read or write operation? The answer is simple. Then if we, we, we do so, then the controller will become a bottleneck. Will the controller become a single point failure? Yes, the answer is absolutely yes. There is a risk that the controller fails. But we can have standby controllers to avoid the single point failure. If you want to know how to design multiple controllers pattern, you can refer to the pestles and the loft algorithms. Cool. Thank you all for listening. Um, any questions? All right. Uh, thank you all for joining the event today. Hope the talk was helpful to all of you. Please feel free to continue the discussion with me on the event page. See you guys. Take care.